Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Good morning, everybody. If we could please come to order. This is the March 2nd, 2020. 9 a.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Welcome and thank you all for being here today. Um, all the commissioners are present. I'm Chair Amy Scaley. We have Vice Chair Steve Carter, uh, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So, uh, Commissioner Boswell, do you have an invocation for us this morning? Yes, I will. Go me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with thanksgiving, Lord, for letting us live in one of the greatest countries in the world. And God, just be with us as we have issues with illnesses that we're not sure how to contain. Lord, we know all that's in your hand. Please give our scientists, our doctors, the knowledge of not, to know how to handle this and how to come up with a, a virus antidote and Lord be with each one of us today as we go about the county's business give us the wisdom to know and do what's best in your eyes these things we ask in Jesus name amen, amen. amen. if you would please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have two public speaker opportunities um, on our agenda. The first is for people who would like to speak on items related to an agenda item. Um, and we have one person signed up for that, and that is Henry Vines. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Henry. My name is Henry Vines, and uh, I live in Snow Camp. Today I come before you, I wanted to speak about the liquor by the drink. Uh, I want to tell you that I'm opposed to it. I'm opposed to it. And um, I'm opposed to it, as I read here, about the reason that we wanted to put this on, uh, the ballot to be uh, voted on, is that so that individuals won't have to come from the country into uh, into the city and take a chance of getting arrested for driving while impaired. Well, first and foremost, they should not be. If you're drinking, you shouldn't be getting behind the steering wheel to start with. Uh, the county has voted on this several times through the years, and we've rejected it each and every time. I think that this is not going to do nothing but create more problems for the sheriff's department uh, in the way of uh, more drunk drivers on the road. It's going to create uh, an atmosphere that we can open up more bars and more uh, nightclubs. Terry's done cleaned up a bunch of those over the years and I don't think that he wants to have to go back and revisit all this. It's going to be a nightmare for the highway patrol and his department as well. Not only on the road, but going out and have to police this uh, problem. It's gonna. It could lead to more shootings and and violence in the county. And quite frankly, I don't. I live in the county, and I just don't think that I, we want it there. And I would appreciate that uh, if y'all wouldn't even put this on on the ballot to be voted on. As the old saying is, I let a sleeping dog lie. Don't wake his dog up. <coughs> And uh, I'd appreciate that and uh, that you consider not doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so, uh, do we have any commissioner responses at this time? No, I saw we we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. I can just say that since it came up, I've had no positive comments about it at all. I've had several people call it to me outside. And, uh, Nobody's made a positive comment in reference to it. Okay. Well, I 
I'll show you what my brother told me this morning. He, and I'll talk about it when it comes up. He called me from Charlotte. And he said, what you need to do is get Willie Nelson's Whiskey River and play it while y'all are talking about it. <laughs> 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 I've got the record right every day. Got it ready to go. Got it all your out there. I'm going to sing it. Right, Brian? Sorry? We could have got, got you to play that for us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want me to play. All right. So, uh, next on our agenda, agenda is approval of the agenda. If everyone has had a chance to review that, make a motion to approve it. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. No. Anyone opposed? And then we have a few items on the consent agenda. Motion approved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the items on the consent agenda. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so uh, our first item uh, presentations and other business is uh, ABSS Lottery Fund Debt Service Application with Mr. Haygood. Well, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I have a number of items, <coughs> excuse me, for you to consider this morning that um, mainly pertain to the education uh, bond process that we're going through. And the first one uh, is this request to use uh, North Carolina Lottery Funds in the amount of $1,459,068. Uh, this request is to use these funds for debt service and we have incorporated these dollars into our capital plan in this dollar amount and uh, this is part of how we fund our overall capital plan that includes the school systems capital projects uh, the PAYGO uh, CIP money as well as their existing debt that we pay the Board of Commissioners and the Board of Education have both approved a memorandum of understanding for this particular request to use these dollars for this purpose uh, on August 19th of 2019. So at this time, I would ask that the commissioners approve this request by the school system for the use of lottery funds for this debt service. So I'm going to approve it. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that request. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. A memorandum of understanding about sales tax reimbursement. Indeed, these next two agenda items are related, and uh, this first is a request for the commissioners to approve an agreement with the school system uh, for, uh, it pertains to sales tax for education bond construction projects. Under the agreement that's in your packet, the county will directly pay for construction costs uh, as part of the education bond process, and the reason being is the school system is not eligible to be reimbursed for um, sales tax. Uh, the county, when we pay sales tax, we're able to apply to the state and we get the sales tax dollars back. But the schools cannot do that. So under this agreement, what will happen is the county will pay uh, the construction costs from the bond debt as part of the budget for each project. The sales tax piece that will be due for all the supplies and everything that sales tax is owed for will be paid from the county's local funds and then we will apply to be reimbursed. The reason this is beneficial is it stretches the bond construction dollars further. Instead sure. of having to use bond construction dollars to pay tax, we get to pay uh, uh, for the projects to be completed. The uh, uh, county attorney, the school system attorney, and our bond attorney have all reviewed this particular sales tax agreement, and it's here for your consideration this morning. Second. Do, do you know how many dollars we're talking about roughly? I mean, well, 150 million. Uh, I think we had estimated at one time it would be several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, it's a, kind of a rough estimate, but uh, it is significant enough that uh, there are other counties in the state that have done this. I think we look particularly at Wake County. Uh, the Wake County Commissioners and the Wake County Board of Education have done this. So, rough estimate, several hundred thousand, but again, if that helps uh, put it's it back into the project. The project. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, and then there's a related lease agreement. That's correct. Uh, so this, this lease agreement that's in your packet is the second piece of uh, this sales tax reimbursement uh, effort. 
So in order for the county to be able to apply for reimbursement of sales tax, the county has to have the school system properties under lease. So you have a lease in your packet that's between the uh, school system and the county for, and it will be, it will apply to the nine properties that are subject to the education um, bond uh, funding. Uh, these properties include the new high school property, Southern High School, South Mebane Elementary, Cummings High School, Graham High School, Williams High School, Eastern High School, Western High School, and Pleasant Grove Elementary. So the county will lease these properties through the lease instrument that's in your packet. And then the, the, the only reason we are doing this is to be eligible to apply for the sales tax reimbursement. The lease document that's in your packet's been reviewed again by the county attorney, uh, by the school system attorney, and by our bond attorney, and found to be acceptable. Uh, so we're asking that you approve this lease. It expires in 10 years or in a 60-day notice. So our desire would be once the bond project is done at the school, we would terminate the lease uh, after we get all our sales tax reimbursements. So. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley. Is there any, are there any questions or discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay, a bond debt update. Yeah, so I thought it'd be appropriate uh, at this point to give you some insight into where we are with our uh, bond debt issuances. And I'm also going to talk very briefly about county capital projects, too. That's a little tag on, but I always feel like county projects are important to, to remind everybody about, too. We uh, presented this information to the um, uh, Capital Oversight Committee last week, and I wanted to be sure and share it. This is a, just kind of a summary of it. Uh, so the main thing that's going on right now with the school system and the community college is they've been tweaking their projects, particularly the timing of their projects. Uh, you know, there's a couple of ways we can save money uh, and, and stretch the bond dollars further. One is what you just did by uh, putting the county in a position where we can get sales tax dollars back. The other way that we can save some funding for the projects is by limiting the number of times we issue debt, right? It's a cost every time we issue debt. There are lots of folks that get paid. So uh, as you can see, uh, we've been working with the school system and the college, and I wanted to kind of tell you where we are with the debt issuance schedule. Originally, the school system uh, was looking at three, three times to issue debt for the $150 million worth of projects. Uh, this May, this September, and then March of next year. And you can kind of see the different projects, uh, how they were planned. Land and upfront costs. We were going to borrow money, uh, a little over $14 million in May, to fund the land acquisition and the upfront costs that the school system uh, believed that they would have. Then we had uh, the September debt issue, which was going to be for the new high school, Southern High School, and South Nevin. Those are the first three projects. And then all the other projects at the high schools uh, uh, were going to take place in Pleasant Grove Elementary, uh, and the debt would be issued for those in March. The school system has refined their debt issuance schedule need to only two debt issuances now. One will be September of this year for $96.3 million. And at that time, the land and the upfront cost for the school system will be part of that debt issuance as well as the funding that will be needed for the new high school as and Southern High School and South Met. Now, some of that will be reimbursed from the county, right? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, and then in March of 2021, another $53.7 million would be issued, and that would put funding in place for all the other education bond projects. The reason, one of the reasons this works and we're able to do this is you can, as Mr. Carter just mentioned, the county fronted, we're currently fronting a little over $7.4 million from our unassigned fund balance to pay for the land to be um, purchased for the new high school, to pay for the design costs for the school system, which has been very helpful. That's allowed them to go ahead and make these kind of designs and buy the land before debt was issued. But at this time, in the school system's capital reserve, we have a little over $12.5 million. So if you remember, back before we even voted on the bond projects, we said we were going to keep everybody's funding separate. School system in one pile, community college in one pile, and the county's capital needs are over in another pile. Well, right now, the school system's bank is $12.5 million. That is enough to pay for the, all the land acquisition costs as well as the upfront costs that the schools know of right now which is great news. That means we do not have to issue debt until September. We'll save those dollars that uh, we're going to be spent to go through the debt issuance process. And it's also good news because 
if we take that 7.4 million from the capital reserve instead of the county's unassigned fund balance, we'll, we'll do this before June 30th of this year. We'll be able to free back up our $7.4 million. So we'll still have money for uh, purchasing of the property and, and paying for the school system's design and architect mm -hmm. fees, but we'll take it from their capital reserve, not our unassigned fund balance. Good news, because if you remember when we had our audit, it was pointed out that our fund balance had gone down. One of the main reasons it went down was because we, we took it out of unassigned and promised it to pay for this. So now we're putting it back in unassigned. It's good, it's good news. What percentage will that bring our fund balance back up? Unassigned fund balance back up? I think we were at 12%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, per the audit. I, off the top of my head, I don't know. We'll have to, we'll take a look at those numbers and let you know what we expect between what we're able to return for the school system and what uh, we're about to return for the community college and let you know. I, I, it will go up. You know, our goal, I think, is 17% or 20. I, I can't the range was 14 to 17%, depending on some other <clears throat> things that are moving at the same time. Yes. Okay. One thing I've learned about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. We won't be at a point in September where we will have spent $96 million, right? No, 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 no. Uh, we'll, we'll be banking that or investing that? That's right. We'll, we'll issue the debt and then make, <clears throat> excuse me, make those funds available for the projects to start. So uh, by September, uh, I think the school system's gonna be in pretty good shape. In fact, I think they may have, they have already started some investigatory work on the property, but we won't be paying out all $96 million in September. Now, when, when are we gonna issue the bonds? The first bond debt issuance will be in September of this year. Okay, September. Yes, well, will those be available to local citizens to buy as well? I think so. I think they can go through the bond market. We have uh, Mitch from Davenport with us today, so I don't know if you can speak to if local citizens uh, can buy uh, these education bonds. Yes, sir. So the way general obligation bond issuance is working in North Carolina, um, for, for folks like yourselves, they're sold at a competitive sale, which means on a Tuesday at 11 a.m., um, we will open up a bid process for all underwriters who care to bid and perhaps purchase the county's bonds. Once those bonds are, are sold at competitive sale, that underwriter, whoever purchases them, will then have the ability to remarket those bonds and sell them to endpoint investors. So through this process, what we'll typically do is we can, county staff will know at whatever Tuesday it is at 11 a.m. who purchased the bonds, and then we can pass that information along to anybody who's interested in buying the bonds. They can tell their broker that X firm purchased Alamance County bonds or, or on, uh, through a competitive sale and we would like to try and get some of those bonds and then their investment broker can go and look for those or they can contact that person who purchased the bonds directly. What sort of investment bonds. return are we looking at now? To the investor, uh, I, mean, I know you can't pay. For, for, the for the investor, it's not a very good return. For you all, it's a great return. You were at all time low rate. Yeah. So, um, we sold, um, we sold two weeks ago, we sold Town of Huntersville, um, North Carolina Geo Bonds. They are rated AAA, AAA. Um, and I think, I think the LGC mentioned it was the lowest TIC that they had seen. It was a 1.72% oh, effective wow. interest rate for 20 year bonds. That's good for the county. Yes. Because you've seen in the market now. Yeah. Rates, rates are continuing, <laughs> or continuing to drop. Um, you know, obviously the coronavirus uh, has folks worried, and the stock market's going down, which creates white quality. People are looking for safe investments like municipals and treasuries, which pushes the yields lower. Um, so it's pretty volatile right now, as you would expect. Um, but generally, what we've seen is the continuing lowering of municipal interest. Well, these are tax-free to the investor, too, right? I'm, I'm sorry? Tax-free to the investor? The bonds. Uh, yes, sir, federally tax-exempt. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, and same information for the community college. As you can see, the original debt issuance schedule for the college was five different uh, bond debt issuances that stretched from this May all the way to September of uh, 2022. The different dollar amounts are there. And uh, those were the projects that were going to be, uh, each debt issuance was going to provide funds to do. Uh, the college has worked to, as you know, combine some of their projects. Uh, and they, they trimmed that debt issuance schedule down to three. 
So the first debt issuance schedule for the community college at this time is going to be March of 2021. That's for a little over $17.5 million. And that's for the Center of Excellence and the parking. As you recall, the college uh, changed from a parking deck to surface parking and put that all together in one project. And then September of 2021 for $17.6 million. That will be for the construction of the training center, the public safety training center, student services, and the satellite campuses. And the final debt issuance for the college is now scheduled for September of 2022 for a little over $4.4 million. And that will be, again, the college, uh, they are discussing the combination of the uh, classroom modernization and child care with their building and grounds and trustees. But we feel like they're going to probably consolidate that project too. Which, again, this is good news. Uh, the less debt issuances that we have, the better. We, we retain those funds for construction. And the community college, of course, is not quite, doesn't have quite the same uh, amount in their capital reserve. They currently have a little over $1.6 million in uh, capital reserve. And the commissioners have fronted the college uh, $3,031,949 for upfront costs. This is for their uh, design and architect uh, fees that they're incurring right now. Well, the good news is uh, they do have some capital reserve, and what we plan to do is similar uh, as we plan with the school system. We will use that $1.6 million to pay for their upfront cost as they incur them and be able to return that $1.6 million back to the counties on assigned fund balance. That's not, we have the $3 million committed, so we won't be able to return all of our fund balance, but we will be able to put the $1,674,000 back, which is good news. It will go back along with the dollars that we've committed for the um, school system and help our fund balance go up. So in next year's audit uh, for, for 19 20, we hope to see the county's fund balance take a significant step up. It is important to note that there's a lot of other things happening uh, that, that affect fund balance, but this is a good move and, and a good way to use that. <coughs> and if there's no other questions about the where we are with the finance, I think the main thing I was hoping the board would take away today is uh, we're issue, we have a new debt issuance schedule, less, less number of times to issue the debt. We're going to help our fund balance out by using uh, capital reserve instead of our fund balance. Good news. And I would like to go over just quickly some information about the county's capital projects. This is information also went over with the Oversight Committee. But I wanted the board to know, uh, you know, we have our own PAYGO projects, our annual list of projects. We, we currently budget $250,000 a year for the county to do our own capital projects. These are the capital projects for fiscal year 1920. As you can see, uh, most of them are complete. We've installed uh, generator hookups up at the Board of Elections at the county annex. Uh, where you can pull a generator up if we lose power. That was uh, really important during voting, of course. Uh, we've also replaced the septic system at the Eli Whitney Rec Center down in the southern part of the county, and we've done some renovations at the EMS headquarters here in Graham. We have two capital improvement projects left from this list. One is the county office building elevator. Uh, we're replacing the car and all the me mechanics inside of it. It is definitely time. That's the original elevator and the original car, so we're going to update it. Uh, and we're also doing some renovations around some of the downtown Graham office uh, buildings, preparing ourselves for our facility plan implementation, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The commissioners will remember, we also have in our capital plan the capacity to borrow $5 million to do some very much needed capital projects for county government that our $250,000 a year just won't get to. So we have this capacity in our capital plan. We came to the commissioners uh, back, I believe it was in September, and got our own reimbursement resolution so we could go ahead and move forward before we issue the debt. We're going to be issuing that debt in the next couple of months. So I'll be coming to the commissioners and we'll be asking you to uh, approve issuing our own $5 million. We've completed several projects that needed to be done very quickly. We've installed generators at the two EMS bases on Rudd Street and Boom Station, which was very much needed in case they lost power during inclement weather, which thank goodness they did not this year, but they commonly do. Uh, we also re replaced uh, roofs at the EMS garage and the Family Justice Center, and we uh, undertook an HVAC air handler and chiller project over at the detention center. These projects uh, are all completed. And we're currently using some of the $5 million to work on a few projects. As I'm sure several of you have seen and are aware of, the uh, foundation issues we have at the uh, jail and the uh, um, J.D. Allen Criminal Court. The, we have done that work. We, I think we have about four weeks left of monitoring the cracks to make sure that it's no longer moving. But the last report we had was good news. 
Uh, we also are replacing elevators. I believe it's three elevators over at the Human Services Center. Again, those elevators are uh, quite old. We actually uh, have had some issues with staff getting stuck in those elevators. I think that just happened fairly recently. So oh, yeah. Everybody will be glad to see those replaced. Um, we have another HVAC project over at the detention center, and the biggest project is going to probably cost close to $2 million over the $5 million, and that's to do significant HVAC work at the Old County Hospital. That, that's been needed for quite some time. Uh, that system is pretty wore out, and uh, we feel like that would be, uh, that'll make a big difference for the employees and for the maintenance department. Have we, in this work over the, uh, in the court building, I was over in the uh, clerk's office over there the other day, uh, about two weeks ago now. There's a number of holes in the carpet, mm -hmm. and they've started to fray badly where we had to drill yes. and to check what was going on the, under the foundation. And it, 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 somebody's actually tripped and almost fallen over there. So have we had a chance to do anything to address that? We, we purchased runners to put down, and they just came in. I had my staff, I hadn't had a chance to get them in yet because we've been tied up with an election. <coughs> And we we asked the clerk and the and the judges and the district attorney to kind of bear with us because we do have a plan for court facilities that in the long run will be much better, I think, for everybody. And I'll, I'll briefly mention that here in a moment. But uh, they've been very patient, but we want to be sure we keep it safe for them too. So I know I know Buddy's folks will be uh, taking care of that um, taking care of that issue with the car. The last, this is the last piece that I have for you about county capital projects. Uh, we have a few special projects going on. One's completed, as you know. We bought the new voting machines. Uh, all that went well. Big thanks to Kathy Holland navigating that whole process with the state and the multiple changes back and forth, what was good to buy and what was not. Uh, if you'll recall, we uh, had originally thought that would be around $3 million. It came in at like 1.1 million, which is good news, and I'll talk about that uh, what that means for us in just a moment. We also have an equestrian center uh, facility underway at Cedar Rock Park that we approved using performance management funds uh, at the last meeting, so that's getting started. And you'll recall Mr. Petrie, who donated the $3.2 million to the county uh, to build the human, uh, Petrie Human Services building over behind Old County Hospital. That is finally getting underway. We've had some real issues. Uh, the creek on that property, Corps of Engineers in the city have been working with us to make sure when we build it, we stay compliant with stormwater rules. But I think we're finally at a place where we're going to be able to move forward very soon. And so I wanted to cover with the commissioners uh, just a little bit of information about possible new construction. So when we save these funds, uh, remember, we're, we're operating inside the capital plan, our own capital plan. We're using our own debt step down and uh, all, all anything we can get our hands on inside the capital plan to stretch out uh, what projects we can do. If you'll recall, we didn't put any new tax dollars into the county's capital plan. The uh, 7.04 cent all went into schools and the community college. So we're living within our means and our own capital plan. And when we save money on the voting machine project, uh, we revisited our capital plan piece for the county and said, what does this mean? And we picked up some extra debt capacity for the future. And one pressing need that uh, we have uh, we talked with our EMS folks as, as the city of Mebane and the Mebane area continues to grow. Uh, we're currently serving the Mebane area for EMS needs through the base here uh, in Graham as well as Red Street over behind County uh, Kell County Hospital. There is a need for the consideration of a new EMS substation over in the Mebane area that would serve uh, all the growth that's happening in Mebane. We think we estimate that would cost about $2 million to construct uh, a new substation. We also would like to construct a new garage and move the garage from here on Maple Street. If you're familiar with it, it's beside um, Rescue, and it's just a really dangerous place. If you ever go through there and watch it, it's yes, it's an old building, and uh, it's very difficult to get the new ambulances in and out. They have to pull out into Maple Street to turn around. I think they've just outgrown the facility. Anyway, we, have, we estimate that would cost $2 million. In our capital plan, uh, we believe we would have the capacity to, to fund that next fiscal year. Uh, we're, uh, we also have looked at our total capacity uh, over the next couple of years for debt. We have about $22 million worth of debt capacity that we can afford within our own capital plan. No new tax dollars needed. And what we foresee those being used for, I'm going to come uh, later on this fiscal year and give you more information about this. But, you know, we talked when we did our county facility plan about 
a new office building for the court staff over here beside J.B. Allen that would let all the judges, district attorney, clerk, all those folks move out of this building, out of historic courthouse, out of J.B. Allen into a new building, and then renovate J.B. Allen. And uh, if you recall, uh, explain to the board that J.B. Allen was built in such a way that you could have eight courtrooms. They're currently offices, most of them for clerk and everybody else. DA's That's right. Th those spaces are all the same proportion as a courtroom. So we would be able to, once we move those those staff out, you could turn that building into seven courtrooms with the jury room. No longer need these courtrooms in civil court right beside of us. Uh, all that would move down to J.B. Allen. And then we believe we would also have funding within this $22 million to build that new building, renovate J.B. Allen into the one court for all court to happen except the historic courthouse. The judges have made it clear to us that folks really like to practice and have trials on occasion up in uh, historic court. But for the most part, under this new scenario, uh, most of the court would take place in J.B. Allen. And we would use part of these funds to renovate civil court and county office building to make this like the, the county government headquarters. We would move uh, m as many other departments in here as we could that are outlying now and try to have that one kind of governmental complex that we have talked about, but not building a new building using and these two. I think that's a great idea. I really like that. I think, I, I personally believe we can do this within our own debt capacity without having to raise taxes, um, which is, you know, a key way to make it work. Uh, uh, to me. So anyway, I'll be bringing more information about this to you in the next couple of months because we'll be we'll be uh, revising our capital plan as part of the budget process. So you'll get to see all of this. But, uh, I wanted to be sure and update the board uh, and let you know what what we were seeing and what was going on. Well, I think it's critical for the state of Graham too that we not do something to Graham like happened to Burlington with uh, LabCorp moving out and just decimating the downtown area. There, I mean, if the city, if the county operations had to go out into the county for space, it would really have a negative impact on downtown Grand. I sure don't want to see that happen. So, yeah, this is a beautiful town. So, mm -hmm. yes. but that's all, commissioners. I, there's no action on this. Piece. Do you have a uh, <coughs> slide up there that shows bond indebtedness as of now, or what it will be at the end of the fiscal year? So, I, I don't have it on a slide, but we do have that information. Um, our total total debt at this time is forty five point four million dollars. That's that's for everything, all old county debt, school system debt, community college debt, and it will get paid down some by the end of the fiscal year. But I, I'm afraid I don't have that. Number. That's an unbelievably good thing. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. yes, it is. You know what? The other counties in our population group. Yeah. 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 It's stunning, really. I think Susan has the what the debt will be at the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. At the June 30th, 2020, we will be at $39,562,622. Tell that to George. Oh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> he's unreal. <laughs> Quick question, a question. Tell me a little bit, real, real briefly, about what that's going to be and the components of it. Yeah, the goal is to have a place for uh, people who don't have horses to come out and ride. So right. it's essentially a barn that we, is the last part of the building <laughs> center that we have to build. So that'll be enough to house eight horses or so. Right hoping to get an outside operator to come in and run that uh, for us to offer horse rides in the now, Do I have to wear a helmet? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be, it'll be up to the operator. You may get an yes. exemption on that. It messes up my hair. Hey, we're going to be a helmet. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to wear helmets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little question, but I forgot yeah, what it was. <laughs> Put it on when you get on the horse, and then I'm not wearing a helmet. <laughs> you slip that thing right off. Nobody, nobody else to know. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions about the bond debt update, you have a reimbursement resolution for ACC bond project. Indeed, uh, commissioners, this is another logistical <laughs> piece of the bond debt issuance project. Uh, we're, re we're requesting that you re approve a revised reimbursement resolution for the community college. The board has approved reimbursement resolutions on April 15th and August 5th of last year. Uh, we did a reimbursement resolution for each project for the community college. Uh, this again is where we uh, fund upfront design costs for the college and we reimburse ourselves. Uh, now we will be reimbursing ourselves as much as possible from the capital reserve or once the debt is issued for these projects. 
But our bond attorney has recommended that instead of having one reimbursement resolution for each project, that all be rolled up into one. So that is uh, in your packet today. Uh, basically, this, the dollar amounts are staying the same. The total dollar amount reimbursement resolution for the college, $3,031,949. The request is to go from multiple resolutions to one. I think Commissioner Boswell has the I've resolution right with the caption. Uh, the resolution of the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, declaring its intention to reimburse said county from the proceeds of one or more tax exempt financing for certain capital expenditures. So, is that your motion? That, that will be adopt? as a motion, yes. That resolution. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? If not, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Anyone opposed? I, I would like to just bring everybody up to date on the safety training thing. They've already chosen an architect for that, and uh, we're going to meet next we week. Mosley. Mosley, the one in the high school group. And also next week, we're going to choose the construction manager at risk. So look forward to getting that project up and moving, Chair, so get you guys trained. <laughs> Great. So you have a performance management program mid year report. I do, Commissioners. Uh, this this item requires no action. This is an update to the board, and you have in your packet the uh, mid year report for the fiscal year nineteen twenty performance management program for Alamance County. And uh, this is this providing this report to the commissioners is one of the county manager's office performance management goals, and uh, this helps ensure that the goals are being monitored, and we're having communications with departments about how they're doing with their goals. And if you recall, uh, I believe it was last year, we tied performance management program, the goals in the program, to our strategic plan. And uh, you know, this is a, a good way to help further the uh, initiatives that have been set forth in our strategic plan. And uh, right now, departments are working on their new performance management goals and will be submitting them with their budget requests. So they'll need to demonstrate to, uh, to us that the budgets that they're putting forward support their performance management goals. So um, if you recall, the uh, strategic plan has five pillars, preserving agriculture, smart growth and development, world-class education, public health and safety, and government accountability and resource management. The, the entire report's in your packet. I'm just going to hit a few highlights. Uh, I thought it was interesting to note under the preserving ag, uh, agriculture um, uh, part of the report and the strategic plan, we've had success. Uh, this fiscal year, the commissioners funded additional monies for farmland preservation, which is uh, very helpful. The um, folks at farmland preservation got in, I think, six applications and have sent one on to Raleigh. Uh, also, we wanted to hit a highlight under the smart growth and development. Um, our 2020 land development plan is in progress. That was one of the uh, performance goals for the planning department. They're having their public meetings and their surveys at this time, and that is well, well underway. And also uh, in the report, you can see that the Parks Department continues to work on the Hall River Trail, which was one of their performance management goals. I think they're working up between Shallowford Natural Area and the Guilford County line in the north in an attempt to continue to push that trail uh, all the way throughout the whole county. Under world-class education, uh, that's one of our strategic plan pillars. Um, the, the, uh, the number of performance uh, goals have been met. Uh, the capital finance plan that we've been discussing this morning was fully funded, and we're tracking it. We're having uh, regular meetings at the TRC level, as well as we've established this oversight committee uh, to help make sure the funding's there and the projects are going uh, as planned. We've also developed this AlamanceCapitalProjects.com website where all this information is at. It is about as transparent as we can make it. You can get minutes of uh, TRC meetings, oversight committee meeting minutes. You can see our capital finance reports. They're all out there for the public to see. Um, the uh, report also mentions that uh, I believe we're doing well in our education funding. We've had a steady increase in operating dollars from the county, from the Board of Commissioners since 2017. And uh, at this time, uh, we understand we're 10th in the state in teacher supplement dollars, which is great. That's a nice place to be. Uh, hopefully, we're staying competitive for teachers. And we plan to work with the, the school system and the community college 
next year to come up with measurements that are important to them that we can include in this report too because you know you're funding their operations sometimes it's difficult for us to figure out what are good county goals for education but they have goals that they are tracking we want to include them next year then under the public health and safety piece of the report uh, you'll note that we did uh, this year hire a mental health diversion coordinator with our maintenance of effort monies and that's been very successful and the uh, health department has received grants for opioid response and has done a lot of good work this year on uh, opioids uh, which is just uh, one of the pressing issues in Alamance County both the county health department and EMS as you can see in the report are now distributing the lock zone which uh, from what I heard at the summit is a, a very important very good way to help people that are having uh, opioid overdo overdoses and then uh, under government accountability and resource management, uh, I want to note that the GIS uh, department, particularly Marlena, has done a lot of work with the census. I know uh, we've established a census committee. Uh, the board chair has been very much involved with that too, and it, uh, we're really hopeful that that'll help get the word out about the census. And uh, we were pleased to see the health department achieve its goal of getting reaccredited. That's uh, very good news for, uh, for health. And then uh, final, final pillar, government accountability and resource management. Uh, uh, maintenance and the IT department continue to do a great job on their responsiveness to work orders. They really do a good job uh, responding to those quickly. They track those and you can see the reports there in the documents you have. And we've also had success in increasing our social media contacts through uh, Facebook and Twitter. A lot of folks get their information about county government now online through social media and uh, we have a very good uh, presence on social media. So. Just in summary about the report, uh, we believe it's been good to tie performance management uh, to the strategic plan, and, and the, the information that you have reflects a lot of hard work by departments. I've only hit I've only hit highlights, and we are working on next year's performance management goals as we go through the budget. So, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. But there's no no um, no action to take on them. I was just curious, where did you guys get the picture of the saxophone? All that? On that's a good that, that might have like been so Alamance County that there's that might have I mean, been Ron King. Uh, Ron uh, is uh, has a drone in, in our IT department. Oh, okay. And does uh, does awesome work. Lives in the Saxball area. <clears throat> does a very good job. I mean, he covered a lot of Alamance County yeah. right there. We got the yeah. land field way over there in the back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Hall River. Yeah. That's a great photograph. Well, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda is a Board of Health appointment. <coughs> Casey Saunders. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So you have in front of you um, an appointment for the general public position of the Board of Health. And we had a couple of candidates. Um, the one being brought to you um, for recommendation is Ms. Salisbury, Ms. Tracy Salisbury. Um, I believe in your packet or in your uh, memo, there were two very impressive candidates, uh, one being the Open Door Clinic Director, uh, Ms. Salisbury, and um, the other being an engineer. And the Board of Health invited both uh, for a meet and greet and interviewed them both. Um, and found them to be both very impressive um, and the Board of Health discussed it thoroughly and ultimately decided to recommend Ms. Salisbury due to her lifelong residency and her position at Open Door Clinic, um, which aligns very much with public health um, and has a hospital link to it as well, um, which helps us with accreditation. So before you is that recommendation from the Board of Health. I will make a motion that we approve Ms. Salisbury for that. We have a motion and a second to approve Tracy Salisbury to the Board of Health. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Tanya Cattle, our planning director, has a presentation about the Alamance County Board of Adjustment for watershed regulations. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Board. Okay. So just, you have a little bit of information in your packet, a little background. Alamance County Inspections Department administers Alamance County's watershed ordinance. Watershed ordinance was updated summer of 18, just before I got here, statefulness and things adjusted and wordings, it was relatively minor, but it was updated in 2018. In that ordinance, 
It calls for uh, availability of variances. There's a minor and a major variance availability in that of people that are having a hard time meeting the requirements of the ordinance. So with that <coughs> type of request, it has to go to what is a board of adjustment, which sits very differently than a board of commissioners or a planning board. Planning board sits as a recommendation board for Alamance County. Board of adjustment sits as a final decision making board. Board of Adjustment also holds what is truly hearings. It is more associated of like a judge and jury, factual base. There are certain merits have to be met by state law in order for that board to approve any kind of variance. So it's a very particular, very specific way that those hearings are held. And it's called a quasi-judicial hearing, mainly because it's held more like a court case. That board consists of five members. The board has not met in just over 20 years. I believe 1996 was the last time that board met. So as we stand, we don't currently have a board, but we do have a request for a variance under the watershed ordinance. So currently we have to evaluate that situation, see where we're at, and probably go ahead and nominate five people, and that was your job, so appoint five people to that board. There are, it's also a contingency in that watershed ordinance to say that there's three alternatives, depends on what we want to do with that if we, to move forward. With that being said, that watershed ordinance kind of sits on its own. Part of the recommendation or part of the requirements, I've just read that to you where the board adjustment sits and the board is specific to the watershed ordinance not, and not used to hear any other cases on any other ordinance, only specific to the watershed ordinance. Uh, the board adjustment has specific membership requirements, uh, consists of seven members, I'm sorry, seven members appointed by the board, three alternates. Also meaning all members have to reside in a watershed. So you'll see the blue areas north and south of the county are the only areas that anyone could qualify to sit on that board. So seven members from those specific areas are the only ones that can qualify for such membership. Can you blow that map up in it? Yes. Kind of I can send you a PDF of that map. <coughs> It'd be nice. To from see. here I can't make it bigger. Okay. It's uh, unfortunate because our county is so tall. It's very right. hard to put all that into a presentation. But it kind of, this is more or less to give you a general idea. It's not just anywhere in the county. It's only in watersheds. And that's any of our watersheds. We probably have a half dozen. <coughs> but any of our watersheds, they have to reside in one. So the darker area is Burlington, right. Graham watershed. That's their city. They their control EJs. all that area. Right. <coughs> so anywhere in the watersheds, they can um, be members. But outside of a watershed, doesn't qualify. To be a member to sit on that specific board for the border adjustment for the watershed ordinance. So it's southwest Alamance, southeast Alamance, a little extreme, bit. right below Mevin on mm -hmm. the orange line, and then all over northern Alamance and western area toward Burlington and Graham. Right. And skipping most of Ossipee. That's kind of how the north was carved out, it looks like. I'm having a problem discerning between the blue and the gray in there, but. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to represent water. So there are Lots areas of water. that you could be in Burlington. You would qualify. That you yes, we qualify. can still. It doesn't exempt unless Clyde. I've never seen anything exempt city membership. It doesn't. Okay, so city anybody in a watershed in the city will qualify as well. Oh, okay. All right. As long as you reside somewhere in Alamance County and you're in a watershed, you can qualify for this. So board. would we take applicants, or would we look for as commissioners go out and try to look for? To nominate for that position. We can do some of both. We can put it out uh, with those specific requirements. It's a very narrow list mm -hmm. of who can qualify. Mm -hmm. And you're also talking about a board that has to be somewhat informed on how these type of proceedings happen. Right. Of course, we're going to train them up. School government gives us a lot of opportunities to train boards mm -hmm. and tell them what their responsibilities are and where their limits are. You know, no outside speaking about cases. These things we can handle. But we need some people with them. Little, at least a little bit of capacity to understand kind of what they're getting into or even some engineering or environmental background. Right. It doesn't sound like it would be a very active board. I mean, 20 years. Well, <laughs> that's when the next slide comes in. <laughs> so future look at board adjustment. Uh, Alamance County Watershed Ordinance has a process that includes board adjustment for specific approvals. The board requires members to live in that watershed. This is where we stand now. As we are currently standing here, we are working on a unified development ordinance to pull all of our 60 ordinances together for Alamance County. And that's stemming from, you'll see up here, 
um, the efforts being driven to the new uh, landing, because of the new land use law, changes and requiring updates to comply with the new general statute 160D. 160D is kind of involved. It actually calls itself the new land use law because it's very specific to land use. Prior, and as we said now, and prior to that approval, county and city requirements and abilities to have any enforcement or rights to jurisdiction sat in two separate general statutes. So over time, and this has been going on for probably 10 years, they finally merged and they put everybody's abilities into 160D. But that being said, all of our ordinances will become non-compliant January 1st of next year because we may not get powers from where we used to, we're now going to be in 160D. So our opportunities are one of two. We can either take each ordinance that we have now, update it with that general statute change, and bring it to the planning board and you all for final approval. 60 ordinances before December 31st. So we know that the prior um, planning director had began working with the planning board and writing a new unified development ordinance. Really not so much new as in bringing in all the ordinances into one with very few changes, not really changing the language, just bringing it together. Meaning that we get our powers from the same place in there, our code enforcement would be the same, and our appeals could be the same. Because right now, your watershed ordinance, your subdivision ordinance, your manufactured home ordinance, all of these ordinances and their appeals and variances go in three or four different places and different ways to get there. So what our unified development ordinance should do and could do is to bring all of that together. And if anybody needs a variance from anything in that unified development ordinance, it would go through a board of adjustment. And that's kind of standard across the state. The state has given those powers to board of adjustments for that purpose. And so plain board and you all would handle more of the, I won't say civil, but more of the use issues, <coughs> land use issues, or changing of ordinances, those kind of things. Board of adjustments, it's very specific to appeals, variances, and here's those types of things. And that's all they hear. Because they're, like I said, they're a quasi-judicial hearing. Currently, you know, you have a planning board that's making you a recommendation, and then the decisions come into the board commissioners for final decision. Should someone not like that, then they can take that to court. That's your next step. With the board of adjustment, they make that final decision. <coughs> no other board is an appeal board. This court is their appeal from that board. So it's a very, like I said, a very specific type of board, a lot of responsibility on that board, and the way they handle their hearings is so specific and very cumbersome, but is necessary. Okay, so if we're looking at, we've got some meetings come up in March and April, I believe, for small area planning for different areas of yes. the county. Mm -hmm. If each area comes up with a plan that's a little different, are all of those going to need to have the same standards in order to, I'm a little confused with how that's going to ultimately work then. Well, this, that Board of Adjustment can still hear, even if each one has their own small area plan, the Board of Adjustment can still hear appeals from any area. Each that's what you're writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each one of them could have something different. Yes, that's the reason we could have some different ideas <coughs> on how development should look from the north compared to the south or the west. Well, and everything is different. There's a lot of difference between <coughs> the southern part of the county and the northern part. Mm -hmm. It's a lot different. I, I think that's a great idea. I think we're getting there. This is something yeah. across the state that's being done pretty commonly. And I don't see any reason for us to bring 60 ordinances to you all by the end of the year. I think making it one, and we'll work through planning board probably in bits and pieces. I don't know that y'all want to see bits and pieces. There's a how y'all want to look at that. But we'll work through how we present to each board. But by December, we can get something, unif a unified development ordinance with everything in it. And like, Part of that unity is code enforcement and appeals and variances. So you look at the regulation and then you know the process right. no matter what you're looking at through the county. I, I had it. It's a good idea. Yeah. Just, uh, With our land development plan and then unified development ordinance, whatever that next step is for Alamance County, this every, will Every part something. of the county is a little different. And you and, can't and put one, <laughs> one pod <coughs> oh, county. To add to that, Bill, I, over on the line where we discussed many years ago <coughs> about the Beaver Hill that's, subdivision. That's right. uh, the lots in Alamance County were in the watershed. They had to be two acres. Mm -hmm. The lots right there beside that lot had to be one acre in Gilbert County. 
so you end up with that between county and county. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I've got a friend that's in, in Beaver Hill that uh, was in Alamance County. Now he's in Gilbert County, so. Mm, but he's got a two-acre lot that right. was originally but Alamance made it be two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you explain just a little bit about what the watershed is and what that's covering? Yeah, yeah. Well, that Whatever is a good idea, but I would caution you that we don't really take questions from the okay, audience so and uh, staff presentations, but... Um, Go ahead. What is the watershed? So watersheds, we've got, like I said, five or six different watersheds. Jordan Lake being kind of a standalone on its own for regulation, and it's being reworked through the next year on what that's truly going to look like. But watersheds are just protecting areas that drain into water supplies. So you have two levels of watershed in any given watershed. There's a uh, balance of the watershed, which is a one-acre requirement. And then there's a critical area which is usually direct to a stream, a pond, some kind of water that's going to flow downstream, and there are two acre minimum lot size. Is there a way that people can find out? So if I were reading about this in the newspaper and I thought that sounds like an opportunity to serve the community that I would enjoy, but I'm not sure if I live in the watershed or not, is there a way for a person, a member of the public, to find out? It is on the GIS website. All you do is search your address, and then there's the layer options. You can turn that watershed layer option on and you can see. So if I were somebody who lived in the in a municipality, I could pull that up for my address and find out that, yes, you qualify for living in the watershed, even though you live in, say, Mevin. Right, so we get our data from the cities. The watershed data has come from the state anyway. It's not specific to us or city. But we have all the city addresses and everything in there, so you should, without a problem, be able to pull that up and check it. And if you have a question, you can call our office. We can answer that question pretty quick. That would be nice. Yeah. People could call you and you could give them a little assist with that. And um, we have an email link on our website that you can shoot an email and it hits every staff member in the office <coughs> and we can answer by email too. It's pretty simple. So we have seven people to serve on the board and then we need three alternates and so that's a total of ten citizens we'd be looking for. Right, so the alternates I guess you could feel now or not, those are more optional right now but the seven are necessary. So it would be nice if uh, each commissioner maybe recruited two people that we know from our personal experience, kind of like we do with the Board of Equalization and Review. Each commissioner appoints one person to serve on that or nominates one person yes, to yeah. serve on it. So if we each kept our eyes peeled for two people, and then, of course, the members of the public who want to serve. All right, because there's the submittal, which comes to me and Tori, I'm not sure who else, when any board of mine is associated, that I want to on the website, you can submit, and it, you write in which board you want, I think, on there. It's not drop down. So you can put in on there, too. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit again. Tori, can you explain to us how members of the public kind of go over that? Uh, if somebody wants to apply for any elements county board, how do they do that? They go to our website. We have a boards and committees little icon, and they just go online, complete the application. Bruce, are you pulling it up? I'm going to give it to Tori. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And then once you get to the end, you have a drop down box to select which option you would like to apply for which board or committee. Um, yep. You see boards and committees? Yeah. Okay, apply for board online. Sorry. And you see apply for board online right there, Bruce? Yes, right there, right. sorry. And this board is going to be called what what name? Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment for the watershed. Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment. <laughs> because it's only specific to a watershed. Exactly. <laughs> Don't be confused with that. They and you know, when we move forward with this change to our UDO, we're not probably going to continue to hold on to that. You have uh, to live in a watershed piece because you're going to hear everything across the county. So then that board wouldn't have any authority in areas that aren't in the watershed then, right? Well, this watershed ordinance board only has the authority in the for right. the watershed, the watershed. But in the future, our County Board of Adjustment would have authority anywhere in the county with any ordinance. So we're going to wind up with two boards of adjustment? No, no we'll consolidate. One. We'll drop down to one. We'll probably get rid of one and either bring those members over or look at what the membership should be. That's kind of completely raw and new how we want to build that. 
there an informal deadline? Are we looking at um, any kind of time constraints? Well, we do have an application on hand that someone has put in and that there is nothing in our orders that says when you have to take it to a board, but we would like to get the board done pretty quickly so that we can train them in here with the application. Ryan, uh, can we get that as a, as a, maybe an ad in the paper? That would be yeah, a good way to get it across. Are we we're looking at people who are qualified and that live in that watershed, and sometimes that's a problem. And if they're not so sure, call Tori. Want to be on the or not? We can do that, sir. Sure. So there's the residency requirement of living in the watershed. <coughs> we also want people who have the time mm -hmm. available. We only have what you said one applicant, but you mean an applicant for a variance, right? Not an applicant to be on the board, but right? One applicant for the, to be heard by that board, yeah, for a variance. So. Um, you need to have people who are willing to, you know, commit some kind of time um, and learning. Say, we need to say something to the effect that they need to have some, some knowledge of the judicial process or something like that. Well, I think they get trained. I think people will train them some. I don't want to narrow it too much where we don't even have right. anybody to talk to. Yeah. That would be great. Um, and then if we could all think of people that um, may be willing to serve that we would have confidence in so. what's, what's the term for the board? No, I think they're three-year terms. Three-year terms. Probably <coughs> oh, ten members with it. Right. So that's two apiece, guys. <laughs> yeah, that at least gives y'all even numbers. Not one gets two, the other gets one kind of thing. I'm pretty sure what three-year term I gotta find it here. But, and that depends on how we do this unified development ordinance, that term may change. Right. Great. Before you go, not now, please, but can you provide us some information on the northern outfall or when it was uh, put in, the theory behind it, and so forth and so on? My understanding runs with the uh, Hall River, which would looks like it would run on the border of the watershed down. I'd like to know more about it. I think it was done in what, the 60s? Is that not? Is that correct? I think that's correct. But a <coughs> yeah, but yeah, the northern outfall, it's, uh, it's it's there, and you can research it. We'll get oh, I'll look into it and see what we yeah, can do. Because my, my thought is, if, if, is there any way to enhance that northern outfall <coughs> where it would affect the water, <coughs> uh, make it more viable for use and development and so forth? Because I've always been told that the northern side, due to the northern outfall, is the most prime area for development. Industrial and so forth and so on, and uh, it's just it's never talked about much. I like to move back to like uh, bamboos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll see if we can find out. Yeah, put in your information basket. Put in your information basket. Uh -huh. <laughs> your information basket. <laughs> yeah, file 13. <laughs> Before you return um, to your seat, uh, could you give us? So you mentioned, I think that we've got community meetings for the land development plan scheduled. Can you? Um, update us on those. I think the first one is at Pleasant Grove. Right. I don't 13th. have that list with me, but there, there's some in March. We're doing the north end and the south end, and then specific in April, we're doing a small area uh, public outreach in Snow Camp. We're doing that at Silver Elementary. Right. There you go. We'll put the it's on the way up. <laughs> April what? 17. April 23rd. April 23rd. 18th and Alpha we, we have sent out to anybody who signed up on the website, anybody who's been to any of our meetings, public involvement at all, we've sent a couple hundred emails out to that. We've put it out on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you, Michelle, where she's at. And we've put out on Nextdoor and any other places we can think of. We've sent for, thank you to Brian for libraries and parts of rec. We sent the actual cards over to people to pick them up. We dropped in Saxby Hall and in uh, Snow Camp at the general stores so that people had paper copies of those postcards. Anywhere we can think of, we're trying to drop stuff off so that people can get informed. If they don't do this or if they just don't know to even look on the web, at least it's somewhere out in the public. We definitely want people to give us their input on the land development plan. Right, because once it's all said and done, it's good for 10 years, so we just have to live with it for that so long. They, they Somebody might do something heard, we don't. They better get it out, right? <laughs> yes, it's kind of like, speak up or hold peace forever kind of thing. <laughs>
<laughs> but yes, if people know things that we don't know, we like to have everybody's input so we make this a very balanced point. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Does anybody need a break? Do we need a recess? Yeah, please. Okay, let's have a recess. <laughs> we can return to order, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. If we could return to order and resume our meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is a presentation by our county attorney, Clyde Albright, about um, what would what are the uh, legal um, steps to consider liquor by the drink in Alamance County. May I make the presentation from here? You got time with me. Thank you. Um, I sent you a brief history of alcohol in North Carolina. It goes back to the prohibition. 21st Amendment was passed in 1933, which made alcohol sales legal again. Are you hearing me? I can't hear you. No. Uh, Get the mic closer there. there. Is this on? It's on. It's like it's on it. down. Better now. Now. That's okay. Uh, so, North Carolina General Assembly, it took them until 1937 to pass a law making alcohol sales legal. And over the past 83 years, uh, towns and counties have allowed alcohol sales by referendum. Now, there are 168 local ABC systems and 430 liquor stores throughout North Carolina. Some counties have nine uh, separate ABC boards. So, the General Assembly, at last year, determined there are too many ABC systems. So they passed a law, 2019-182, uh, which prohibits the creation of a new ABC board. It also requires um, that if you are going to have liquor by the drink in the county, such as Alamance, we have to merge <coughs> with an existing ABC board. And that could be Burlington or Orange County or a city in Gilson County. But you have to have that merger uh, completed. It has, the details have to be negotiated and distributed to the voters before this goes on the ballot. And then, <clears throat> if we do arrive at an arrangement with a merger and profit sharing, these type of things, then you can put that on the ballot. Let me ask you something, Clyde. Yes, sir. Uh, who, who has to make that decision to, uh, to get them boards together? Is that our decision? Yes, yes, it will be, uh, and, and it'll be the <coughs> board, of course. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to talk with a, with a Burlington ABC board, start discussions with them. <clears throat> and you know, we have to make that agreement before we can have the right to put it on the ballot. That's correct. I talked to the general counsel of the ABC commission and she's the one that referred me to this new law. Uh -huh. And that has to happen first. And then if, if that happens, then you can put it on the ballot and, and the referendum. Who, who, would, who would do that? The county manager would... Uh, He's speaking for us. I would, I would suggest he might be the better one to do it. For the person he delegates in his office, maybe. Sure. Well, I, I could assist him with it. I'm sure I would. If, if you were to task me with doing that, I'm sure I'd be working closely with Mr. Yeah. Albright to uh, make sure we that's why dotted the I's and cross. going to be responsible to get that done and because by the time we get it on the on the ballot in November, and it's got to be done pretty soon, I think. Would that... Would that isn't that right? What's the deadline on the ballot? Is that only that in May? Something like that? If you're doing a, I think the sooner you kind of start of, discussions, the better off you'd be. But just like with the bonds, we had to right. have that done in so many months mm -hmm. before the ballot. That's right. The, the new law doesn't talk about that. It just says you shall enter into an agreement with an existing board to create a merged local board. But do we have to have the approval of the other boards in the county that are in municipalities just, as well? Just the board you're merging with. Just the one we're merging with. Yes. For instance, if you wanted to merge with the Chatham County ABC board or the Haswell County ABC board or uh, Orange County. I would think they I would I would think they would be interested in uh, allowing us to yeah, partner with I would, any any of them. Yeah. But you know, maybe, maybe the city of Burlington would be more I don't apt know to one Something person. that's inclusive in Alamance County, I think. And the alcohol distributed from the facility in, in uh, Graham. Right. But that's it's all distributed from Raleigh and then 
it goes to the local warehouse and then from there distributed to the establishments in the, if it passes in the county. But there's several hurdles you have to first. And the, the first one being this merger agreement. The that's other not, alternative is what building the stores or how we might run. Well, once you once you merge, you serve at the pleasure. If the merger is complete, <laughs> and if the and if the voters of this county decide that it's a good idea and it passes, then then the question comes: Does the county want to open an ABC store in the northern part of the southern part? Of the and that and that's just a, I suppose an issue of how much money you think you're going to make and if you can justify opening up your store. Well, we don't even know if it's going to pass. Let me ask you something else. The people who vote, <coughs> the cities, the employees, I mean the, the people of the cities get to vote also, but it's not just the county. Well, the county ballot. It's everybody. That's but it's everybody who lives in the county. In the county. Yes. Make that decision for the people who live in the county. county. Okay. And you, have to, and you have to have this, remember, you have to have this merger agreement distributed. Yeah. Because everyone can read it. And prior to yeah, putting prior it. To. Okay. <coughs> So the terms <coughs> would have to be negotiated with the ABC store that we would be seeking to merge with. So is it possible that those terms could be negotiated like uh, if we were to talk to Burlington or, or Graham about you know working with them to have an ABC board? Um, could, could it possibly be different terms and so you could negotiate with different entities to try to get the best circumstance for the county. I mean, I, I'm not really clear on what the financial trade-offs would be between the county and the um, whoever it is that we would seek to work with. I think the, the biggest thing is the distribution of profits. How and and don't profits. some of the profits go right back into the school? They do. But you, you don't have to limit your merger discussions to one entity. You can have three or four going at the same time if you choose. To seek the best situation for the county. I think they're all going to be probably the same because they're all they all have ongoing <coughs> systems right now, and they'd be you'd be asking to join their system and share in the profits. And each municipality is run by their own board, right? That's correct. I've attached a list that I got from the. Uh, so no, no, all the profits go back to the school. No, no, not all of them. Um, let's see, in Alamance County, we have Burlington, Gibsonville, Graham, Nevin, and Swetsonville. Each one of those have a board. No, uh, they have a. They they are part of the uh, part of the the system. That are set, that's set up. I don't think Swetsonville has a board. I think that's just simply a permission from the state to sell alcohol uh -huh. at, the, at the golf course down there. Which is there no more. Uh, Gibsonville is, um, <coughs> they have an ABC store in Gibsonville. Right, but it's in, on, the, on the Guilford County side. Yes. So I think they merged it out. It's not, as, it's not as straightforward as I initially thought with this new law. I'd just like to ask the sheriff if he has any thoughts on the process. <laughs> on the process? <laughs> Not on the process necessarily, but on the possible outcomes. Well, uh, well certainly, you know, you're going to probably catch more BWIs. Uh, may have some wrecks. You know, but That's what alcohol does, weekly. Yeah. Drive drunk for, have a tendency to drive drunk. <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. which uh, bar they're sitting when I was in. On the police force, that was one of the, the biggest problems. That was, this would have been 50 years ago, and it hadn't changed no. to this day. I'll tell you, you know, ABC stores, you know, would be the best. You go to these bars open, you're going to have shootings, you're going to have your bikers coming mm -hmm. in, you're going to have all kinds of problems for law enforcement. Yeah, ABC store in the county. Uh, you know, once somebody goes get it, take it home, uh, it would be less problem for us. Well, the reason I brought this up is because the, the 
people in the county should have the same rights as the people in the city. You know, I'm not in favor of liquor by the drink, but by golly, the people deserve to be treated fair. The people that own the bars in the, in the county de deserve to be treated fair. You know, and I'm, I'm say I'll also say that, you know, all I'm asking is to put it on the ballot and let the people decide. And I found it interesting. Castle does have liquor by the drink. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found that to be very interesting. It is. I'm surprised to hear that. Yes, cows drink it. Must be farmland. I guess. Drunk cows. <laughs> Well, if we still talking about it, yeah. you make a motion. Yeah. Uh, you know, alcohol is the biggest drug in the United States, whether you like it or not. It is. <clears throat> and I have said for years I would never support liquor stores in the county, period. Uh, Talk law enforcement in Greensboro. The club stay up at 2 o'clock. If it's up to me, I close every club at 1 o'clock. It's very late. And you look at the club owners, or you, you look at law enforcement, and say, Look, you know, if you close the bars at 1 instead of 2, you cut crime in half, or drunk driving in half, shootings in the parking lot in half. Yeah, we know. That. And I'm asking, asking myself, why don't you try to get it passed? He said, it's money. It's money. Mm -hmm. Bar owners want the money. Uh, you know, they serve beer, which is almost double the alcohol content that it was when I was in high school. It's over 5% of minimum. And I believe that bar owners will sell a beer as long as they can sell it till they close. And I don't think they're Possible as maybe they should be, and refusing to sell. And I don't think it would stop with liquor. Uh, I understand what you're saying about rights. Uh, but to have to drive to Burlington to get a fifth of Bacardi's or Jim Beam or whatever, I don't think it's a violation. Such a violation of a right as it is the fact that you maybe can't drink. I, mean, I could care less if they can't buy a mixed drink in a bar down a back road in Alameda County. I could care less. <laughs> and I just, as far as putting it on the ballot, yeah, you know, I think there's things we have to put on the ballot. We have to put the bond referendum on the ballot. So forth, so on, because you got to pay for it. And it's a lot of money. But I think there's some things that commissioners. And leaders ought to take a stand on and not feel like they got to turn it over for a vote every time they turn around. Uh, you know, I'm for moral, ethical uh, implementation of the mores of this county. And I don't think the mores of this county uh, fit down the line to liquor by the drink. I just don't believe it. And uh, so I, 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 can't, I can't support a referendum. I can't support doing whatever, the negotiations, which I don't think would pass. If it passes, so be it. And I certainly wouldn't want to give schools as a justification for doing it, the fact that they're going to get the money. Uh, I don't want to get too personal in here, but, you know, Rick Gunn went down to Raleigh, and he had a, an agenda to get liquor sold on brunch bill. Yeah, brunch bill. That would hardly, it hardly would have been one of my agendas. Items. I think if you look in the campaign contributions about alcohol, beverage, whatever, I mean, I've been trying to find those figures, and I'll get them eventually. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, it blows my mind. It really, it really does. I stand up front of teenagers all the time talking about the evils of pain, the challenges they're going to have as teenagers, college kids, uh, going to parties where the punch bowl would spike, uh, and the, the evils of alcohol, 
I'm not a teetotaler as much as uh, I accept that. I don't drink. I don't. I haven't had a beer since my wife died. And that's been 15 years. The only reason drinking then is because she died. I can take it or leave it. Now you send me to a stock car race, that might be a different story. But <laughs> I just don't. I, I don't understand it. I honestly don't. Yes, it's legal. I don't want to go back to prohibition, but I think the tightest control of it within your boundaries that you're responsible for governing needs to be as tight as possible. That's just my personal belief. Had an ABC guy behind me one day at the grocery store. And I said, they still sell every clear grain alcohol? He said, yep. I said, is it still 180 proof? Nope. I said, well, what is it now? He said, about 150 something, he told me. And uh, I said, why did they lower it? They were killing people. Just killing people. <laughs> the state supports wine tastings at the farm center in Greensboro, the market, what do you call it, Fresh Market, whatever. I've seen people stumble drunk from, they're going from tent to tent to tent to sip wine. <laughs> and they get drunk before they can get back in their car. I've seen it. Uh, so I, I just, you know, the number of alcohol, they say that 50% of, uh, well, 38% of all wrecks involve alcohol. Uh, I, I just, you know, it would be so hypocritical of me what I believe to, to vote for, uh, vote for. I just if you can't get the alcohol you need by going to Burlington or Graham or wherever the stores are, which I don't know, where, I know where Maple. I mean, in, in, in Grand Hope is. I'm sorry. Go buy you a six pack of beers. But uh, that's the way I feel about. It. So I don't vote for nothing that furthers the promotion of liquor in our county. And I'll state again, I'd like to see every bar in this county have to close it for one. All, all you got to do is go in there and look at the number of shootings in the parking lot when the wrecks take place. And it's like 2 o'clock, 2.30. They come out of those bars loaded, and they start playing cowboy. And I, I just, you know, God bless y'all. I ain't going to say nothing personal about nobody. But uh, I, I just want to, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. So that's all I got to say. And I would sing Whiskey River, but I'm not. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put your, three, put your long hair on. <laughs> well, I can do swinging doors. You want me to do swinging doors? Earl Hager would do that one. Jim, I, I agree with uh, some of what you said there. Uh, ever since Bill brought this up, I've been struggling with it. And like I said earlier, I haven't heard any positive comments. But I do go back to something that uh, happened probably. 40 some odd years ago, Judy and I were heading back to her home one weekend when I was going to East Carolina. And I didn't know it at the time who was in front of us. They passed us after we asked we made a stop and we caught right up to them. And there were four nursing students, East Carolina nursing students ahead of us, probably less than a quarter of a mile ahead of us. And uh, in one instant, I just saw a huge explosion of steam I guess it was and these guys in, a, in one car crossed the center line hit those girls head on and we were right behind them we were first there I just told you to stay in the car and I got up to that car and the girl driving was dead the three girl, the other three girls in the car were all badly injured <laughs> and I, that's the kind of thing that EMS folks and law enforcement fire department see all the time. That was the first and last time I've ever seen it, and I don't ever want to see it again. Um, I know of a situation in our in family where we've had uh, a grandparent killed by a drunk driver, and uh, um, I have to admit that as I struggle with whether to turn this over to the voters or not, and with the history of the voters saying no in the first place, I'm kind of inclined to go along with you, Tim. I don't even think it needs to go there. But, um. and my opinion is it would take a lot of our resources to be able to even make it work, but even go on the ballot. And we got a lot of other urgent issues at hand that we need. 
Yes, and to agree with Commissioner Boswell. <coughs> You know, when we, the subject came up, we needed more information about how to go through the process, and we've gotten that today, and a better understanding about what would be required. Um, my personal approach to making decisions, policy decisions, is to weigh the costs and the benefits. Who pays the cost, or, yeah, who pays the cost and who gets the benefit? And how substantial is the benefit how substantial is the cost? And as I see it, there's a cost to the county of going through the process to get this on the ballot without even knowing if there's going to be, you know, the voters are going to approve it. I have received negative comments about it as well since it was first brought up. Um, so I would tend to agree with Mr. Boswell that, you know, we have other things to focus on with our staff time right now rather than, um, trying to, you know, prepare it to be on the ballot in November, especially knowing that we have, you know, a, di a timeline that we have to follow in order to prepare a referendum for the ballot. So I think it's admirable and commendable that Mr. Lashley was brave enough to bring it up. And I think that's what this is all about, is um, people having ideas, bringing them up to the public attention. We give them a thorough look over and discussion and, and then we listen um, to the public's feedback too. listen to the public yeah. and consider our resources that we have available mm -hmm. there's two things that we have finite we have infinite compassion we have infinite caring we do not have infinite time and we do not have infinite money so we have to be really careful when we're um, using the resources of time and money because those things belong to the taxpayer so um, I guess I will conclude our discussion of that this time unless anybody else has something they want to say. So if, if there's no further discussion on that agenda item, we'll move on to the public speakers who want to address the board on a non-agenda related item. And I have James Walker signed up to speak. Mr. Walker. Hey. Hey. Great. Nice to see you today. I'd like to ask permission for the county commissioners. I've talked to Mr. Johnson, Mr. Hill, and said they have got some one trailer I know about picking up trash, but you need two, one in the thorn in the county and one start down the sun end and go work your way up. There's trash everywhere down there, and it ain't helped a whole lot by putting them tarps on those who got the signs up down there at the landfill. But my understanding, we're waiting on the county commissioners to give them permission to let them to go ahead and let Mr. Johnson start working on account of health reasons. Is that right or wrong? The sheriff, do you have any? Can you address that? Uh, we we have made arrangements. that we've got the uh, stuff from the state with the Port of Johns and, and et cetera. And what we're, we're having to do now, figure out uh, where the manpower is going to come from. I've talked to uh, Judge Brad Allen about he, the, the judges and probation filling our jails up sometime. At, on Friday, and you'll have 25, 30 people show up for a weekend. DWI. I locked brother and they just can't get done. I locked brother for when they show up Saturday morning at seven o'clock, we get the road to pick oh, up trash right. till seven o'clock at night and to help clean the road and also keep our jail from having to spend money on these places. Now what and what resources would you need to make that happen from us? Well, I'll be honest with you, we have we have got to have some people, uh, at least two two guards taking them out. I can tell you that right now. Uh, and right now we are, are, and I'm not trying to say we're short in. I'm just right. telling the way it is. Uh, but he is right about the right. Now. I've even gone out and picked up uh, sofas and stuff and uh, carried it up and things like that. But it's it's getting bad. People are throwing sofas, every kind of trash you can think of. Now, Mass County used to not be that way. Uh, I've told my people, you catch one throwing out any kind of trash, write them a doggone ticket. Absolutely. I, I got a question. Yes, sir. These guys that are on probation, how much are they costing 
you yes. every weekend to be housed and taken care of. Well, not only is it, is it costing us, but there's uh, what there's I call a liability go into the jail. Right. Uh, all kinds of, of, of stuff problems for us. So and there may be a cost benefit enough to even pay for those deputies. The landfill, they could pay it out of their money. Well, that is, I don't know if that's possible. Couldn't it? <laughs> we, we need to ask. They, get an argument. they have their own funds. So they hire people. So. <laughs> 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 they had plenty of money. Well, they have to spend their money on definite particular things. The money, a lot, most of the money that the landfill has is to replace the landfill when it gets full. Can we sign that temporary like uh, employment for the weekend? So, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to. Mr. Walker, thank you for bringing this to um, our attention yeah. and our discussion. I think that there has been discussion with the sheriff about how to address the trash in the county. And I think that we would be having a presentation from the sheriff in the next right. couple of months um, related to that topic. Not clear because I noticed it wasn't a whole lot happening, but tarps going up. And when Mr. Johnson had his people down at the sheriff's department, down at the landfill, I went down there. Well, as soon as they left, I left and met them coming in and they didn't have no tarps on. Yes, sir. Enforcement's so, tough. That's yeah. very aggravating. I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair, we've been meeting uh, with sheriff's deputies and Cliff Parker, and we've been doing a community effort. We're also creating a website. Um, the DOT gave us some a trailer and stuff like that. The we did check with the enterprise fund. We could get tires for it because it didn't have decent tires. You know, there's safety issues we even have to do for those folks. We have to get that straight. They were shooting for the end of February. Tire thing delayed a few weeks. We're also coordinating for the litter sweep with the DOT. So we're we're creating a web page where all those resources are together, um, including adopt a highway. The DOT will gladly give out trash bags, gloves. Uh, safety equipment. They're also contacting their Dr. Highway. My own personal scouts have been involved with that. You know, it's going to take a whole community effort to do this. I mean, I'm ashamed of it too. I've stopped myself. I've taken my boys to try to teach them, like, this is your place, you know, clean up your mess. And if it's somebody else, we clean it up too. So it's a community effort. We got to step it up. And I know the Sheriff's Department, like I said, he's already put a deputy down there. And like you said, you're right. When the deputy uh, talks about tarping your thing, they People tend to listen a little bit more than the staff, but um, we're also we're going to be monitoring that as we go forward. If we need to add more teeth to local ordinances to do that, it's already against the law to litter, and so we don't want to overburden the taxpayer with too many laws that counteract each other. But at the same time, we recognize the problem and we are addressing it. You know, Mr. Hager, it seems like to me that we've been, there's been a lot of discussion between various county departments, a lot of work has been done on this that concern people like Mr. Walker are just not aware of. Can we have an agenda item related to litter in the county and the efforts that Mr. Walker's been talking about? Um, can we do that at the next commission meeting, please? Perfect. If there's any way I can help, I'll be glad to help. Right, thank you. Well, you've helped a lot. Uh, Brian, I, did, I did work for the state 30 years. Right. And then I worked for the health care system 13 yes, after sir. I retired. And you and I have had a couple of conversations yeah. about this as well. Yeah. And, and Chief Parker, yes, these guys coming in without their tarps on, I know that Highway Patrol writes some tickets if they leave the lumber yard or leave with loose debris in the back of a truck and they don't have a tarp on it. Do we have that authorization? Yes, sir. The sheriff authorized our uh, captain of patrol to last month, about every weekend on Saturdays, we had patrol deputies stationed down on the road leading into the uh, uh, landfill, and we were doing more of a public service announcement. We're trying to get compliance over enforcement. Right. And get the word out. The landfill is providing uh, opportunities to get tarps. We're warning people. We're doing all that, and deputies are authorized, as the sheriff said. Anybody that's coming into the landfill and spreading trash right. will be cited. And then uh, there's a number. We've had several meetings, as uh, Bruce mentioned, on this. And I didn't get a chance to brief the sheriff this morning, but I just talked to our major over detention. Uh, the trailer 
uh, tires were put on last week. It's ready. We have to have OSHA training. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. And then we have to actually get trustees who are available to come out of the jail because they prepare meals. And then we have to have the staff to go out with them. And it's a minimum of two, probably more like three, uh, three deputies people. that would have to come out detention officers with them. And then, but it's a coordinated effort. There's going to be an active map put out so that folks all over the community can participate. And kind of as Bruce brought up, uh, someone else in here brought up before, kind of the, uh, y'all talked about uh, keep America clean and kind of like keep elements clean and just make it an emphasis uh, throughout the county. So, and I've already seen areas that I frequent being cleaned up by volunteers. DOT is out doing that now with their budget cuts. They've been putting their staff out cleaning roads. So there's a lot of it already going on. So. Very good. I, I did notice I went down fr last Friday and we we could go and there's a deputy right going in and out there at the landfill. And, yeah, and so. line of road and all them down yep. there. They're just covered with trash. Very good. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll look forward to kind of a comprehensive overlook about what the county's doing to. Um, address the litter problem in the county at our next meeting so we can kind of pull all of those threads together into one presentation. Um, we have one more speaker signed up and that's Donna Poe. Good morning, Hello, good morning, morning. commissioners. <clears throat> and I'm here once again representing the concerned citizens of Snow Camp who have been patiently but anxiously waiting waiting as hostages for this nightmare and threat to our health, safety, our water wells, and well-being to end. <clears throat> While having endured over the past 18 months the possibility of a rock quarry in the middle of our peaceful rural community. And we fear what else is planned as Mr. C. Wayne McDonald continues to form additional anonymous LLCs out of Wyoming as recent as this past September. Clark Road Properties LLC, under the radar of all of us and you, to purchase additional properties and has next to the proposed quarry. Yep, true story. The community is asking, what is the result of the outside council permit evaluation to include the two different maps clearly showing streams that were omitted from the county site plan and our attorney's July 1st letter citing the very clear violations which render said permit invalid? It's just been too long and we can't wait any longer. What's going on at the state level, you will ask Mr. Albright. He never really has an answer, so I will tell you. They are in the th third round of requesting information, and quite frankly, we believe the bottom of the ninth, as we are in contact with them weekly. <clears throat> it's just a short window before they will issue that permit and the green light given for this anonymous company to begin preparing for the end of snow camp as we know it. Because of the way the 2011 Hido reads, they can begin clearing and building as soon as that state permit is issued without any additional steps required by the county until they start blasting. But wait, what about that change site plan? As it states in the HIDO under Section 4, Item 2C, any changes or amendments to an approved site plan but prior to construction must be submitted by the applicant to the planning department for review and approval. Has that happened yet? I don't think so. Or do we just wait to see if, if C. Wayne McDonald pops into Ms. Tanya's office any day now and shows her what we have come to know as the different state map, which is radically different from what was approved by Libby Hodges to include streams omitted intentionally from the county site map? <clears throat> or do we as citizens need to continue being watchdogs and sound the alarm again when they begin clearing land? For Tanya to then maybe contact Mr. McDonald and question him about what she has been made aware of through discovery of a changed plan, or even worse, not say anything until she goes out for the final inspection prior to the operations permit is issued after all is said and done according to the unapproved change plan just doesn't make sense. So again, I prayerfully ask, what's going on? What's your next step? We know ours. Please, please discuss this in your closed session today if you haven't already planned on it. Do not make the community of Snow Camp wait any longer. We just cannot. We've been through enough. Thank you for your time, leadership, power, and faith to make this wrong right. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you, Donna. All right, that's our last public speaker. 
Um, we had our responses to Mr. Walker. Does anybody have any response to Ms. Bo? We'll move on to the county manager's report. Um, Mr. Hager, do you have a report today? I only have one item uh, to bring to the commissioner's attention. Uh, the county is preparing to implement a new program of uh, uh, purchasing cards. It's a new way for us to do business in county departments uh, to better help uh, county departments be uniform and consistent when they're buying materials and supplies. And I'd like to ask Susan just to give you a brief overview of how that will work. Good morning, commissioners. Um, this is a state contracted program. Bank of America holds the state contract and you have to actually apply to become a member and Alamance County has been accepted and approved. What this will do is as more and more businesses and companies are looking at more of an electronic means of payment, this will allow us to have greater oversight than just issuing a uh, credit card. We have limits that we will be able to put in place and can actually restrict what types of purchases can be tied to each card. So it's a great benefit to the county, and also with this being a state contract um, vendor, there is also a, the ability for the county to receive a rebate for purchases that are made used in these cards. So this doesn't require any action by the board, but we felt like it was appropriate to let you know. It's a good program. I think we're moving into the 20th, 21st century <laughs> with our uh, electronic payments, and I'm sure the departments and the vendors will both appreciate it. Is this like uh, the vendors giving a reimbursement on certain items? Um, so what they've done is with it being a state contract, Bank of America has been able to negotiate some rates with different credit card um, companies and therefore those processing fees, they're able to offer a rebate back to the county for utilizing the program. So we'll get like a percentage of what we spend will come back to the it's county. Like on the credit card. That's right. Every time you spend, you get one and a half, two percent. Yeah. Yeah. If that speed up the, uh, the process. Yes, it will. It will. And, and that's all. Okay, great. Do we have any commissioner comments today? I have one. Okay. Uh, I've been thinking about something for quite a while that really kind of came to a head to me this past week. Um, we are, we're a rapidly growing community in Alamance County, and we do an annual budget, but we look at a capital plan that goes out multiple years. and. I, I believe one of the things we need to start looking at is a at something like a, a very minimum of a five-year anticipated budget. This would give us an opportunity to look at anticipate the growth on a longer curve than just over the next 12 months and anticipate the revenue growth and how we plan to spend that money to meet the needs of a growing community going forward. And it's not in concrete. <coughs> but it gives us an opportunity to look at things and plan accordingly so that we can make sure that we anticipate needs in a way that hopefully we can maintain a lower tax rate for our citizens, but at the same time support the new people coming into our community, the infrastructure they need, the infrastructure we need with courts, staffing, because this is not a capital part. The capital part takes care of the real estate and the equipment, but we need to take care of our people. And uh, I know in the recent discussions, we were, we're running in a number of situations where we're, we're losing people because we aren't keeping our salaries up to date on a regular basis. We, we drop behind even our own local market. And we need to make sure that we're, if we're hiring people and training people and bringing, bringing them in and equipping them to do the job, that we don't lose them to the other agencies or other organizations because we are keeping things up to date. And a long-term plan makes that a little bit easier to do. And it's more business-like. Businesses don't do an annual budget and end up look any yeah. further out than that. Um, I've worked with businesses for my entire career, and most of them do at least a five-year projection so they understand what's going, going to happen to them and get prepared for it and anticipate when they, they need to bring new people in and so forth. And our departments need to be in the same position. I think you have a sympathetic ear, Mr. Hager. Yes. You can talk about that. <laughs>
Yeah, he said amen. I thought. Yes, that's right. The county's done a, a very good job with its capital plan and uh, laying out, you know, uh, multi-year project lists and how to fund them. And uh, it's important that you know, we we have begun to have those discussions about revenue projections over multiple years. You know, you, you look at how we've trended, and you, you always have to know that the economy is beyond our control, but we're seeing a good economic situation right now. Uh, so part of, part of multi-year budgeting would be revenue projections over many years, and also looking at some of the large ways that we spend money. We spend, we spend the majority of our money on education and on public safety. Uh, so really, at the least, making sure we're looking at those uh, large recipients of the county dollars and how we foresee them growing and and uh, also compensation for uh, employees that's another uh, huge piece we have some very baseline things that we do right now uh, and but we watch those and try to estimate how implementing our kind of baseline compensation package right now will grow uh, as time goes on too so uh, it is very important to do and I hope that uh, as we work on this year's budget, we can start uh, incorporating that that uh, multi-year process. Well, the sheriff gave us an interesting uh, report last meeting that uh, I've had an opportunity to read through. And I asked him to take a look at another piece of that. But one piece that was, I felt was missing was that if we were to bring people up to where they need to be in order to retain people, and we've lost, I think it was 26 staff members from just our sheriff's department uh, in the last 12 months and you know that kind of turnover stresses as he just said we, we, we won't we've got an opportunity for DOT to pay us to do some of their work cleaning up the sides of the roads with these uh, with, with the, with the uh, detainees and uh, we can't do that unless we have enough staff um, I've asked him to take a look at an additional piece of information, and that would be once we get our sheriff's department staff up to where it needs to be, how then do we keep them there? What sort of COLA adjustment does it take, and what kind of cost of impact is that? And I think we need to be taking a look at that kind of information across all of our departments. Yes, we've made a, a real focus of effort on it for over the past year plus on looking at very high turnover positions in county government, your deputy ones, your detention ones, telecommunicator, paramedic, and then the Department of Social Services probably has four. Uh, we also have issues with public health nurses. So we're really trying to look at what can we do across the board? How do we retain the good folks that we've got? And we're recognizing that we have some specific departments with specific position types that are very difficult to recruit and retain. It's the nature of the work. And the fact that we're in the Piedmont of North Carolina where there are lots of police departments that compete, a lot of EMS uh, agencies that compete. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a difficult task, but certainly one worth uh, pursuing uh, for sure. On well, a related vein, um, did we do our last rebel in 2017? Is that right? And at the time, I remember there was discussion. So currently, Alamance County has an eight-year reval cycle for um, property tax purposes. Right, and there's been some discussion about um, doing a four-year cycle instead of an eight-year cycle. Um, and we talked about that, I guess, in 2017. Maybe that's the last time we really discussed it. And uh, I was reflecting on that when um, we were talking about it in 2017. I was kind of like, I don't know, because of the expense involved in a reval. But I understand, Mr. Jenkins, that your office does a good bit of work where it wouldn't be as expensive and cumbersome to do a reval as maybe as it has been in administrations prior to yours. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there is a significant cost that, that is unavoidable with the revaluation. Um, ours is a little bit less than average. And we've also positioned ourselves in this last year's budget uh, to be able to uh, perform the, the technical pieces of that reval more quickly, more fluidly with less resources because the routine keeping the data up to date and clean is being done every year now as we kind of split those functions. So we're in a better position with that. One of the things that I'm concerned about for the future is that if you wait every eight years to do it, then we could have a replication of what happened 
and the reval before this past one. So I guess that would be the reval of uh, 2011 when there was a housing bubble that had burst and people were had a lot of um, difficulty because the tax valuation on their property was not was substantially more in many cases than their real their <coughs> value for their property. And it seems like if we do revise more free, you know, every four year cycle, then we could help people avoid that, where the tax value is more accurately reflective of their fair market value. I read uh, <coughs> last week in the Herald Sun where Wake County, you know, they're on a four year cycle and they had seen 20% uh, increase in value in Wayne County per the- In four the years. In four years, well. Now we're, we're three years into our cycle and we're estimating we're at about 13% as it sits. And that's just the, the rate that the market is flying. And so a shorter cycle has some advantages. It, it keeps us current with what really is happening mm -hmm. today. Did Forsyth County drop though? And Last news I heard over there, I don't know the tone anyway, that it had dropped, it wiped raised taxes to yeah. get the same revenue. Yeah. I haven't heard that. But yeah, I've check that out. I'm curious about that. that a couple years ago. Is there interest in the board in exploring that further? I think so. I, I think, think so. I think it's, it's a good it's idea. It's a shock yeah. of getting a big bill in every eight years. I know there's an expense, but it's not as big an expense if you wait for eight years to jump into mm -hmm. it right. again. So we're at the first meeting in March. What would the board have to do in order to switch over to a four-year cycle? I don't know that a four-year cycle is attainable from 2017 at this juncture that we're so far in. I'd have to have that by January. And, and that one year is just too time. Um, a six-year cycle, is that, what I have discussed uh, is the possibility of uh, incrementally going from an eight to six to four, kind of having a transition. Uh, so we can look at a six or we can look at a, at a five. I really need about two years of, of lead time. I can do a little bit less. Now, you know, with, with, with the board's uh, support, we, we can do it in a year, but I'm afraid that begins to balloon cost because there, there's some inefficiencies to do it that quickly. That sounds good. Do you think that maybe we should have a presentation about this at our next, uh, since I brought it up in commissioner comments, kind of piggybacking off mm -hmm. what Commissioner Carter said. I mean, that all works hand in hand with what you're saying, Steve. Do you think maybe we could have a presentation at our next meeting about that? And that would still be before we get into budget presentations from uh, ACC and ABSS so that we have to be um, careful about our meeting time and not adding too many things when we're in budget season. Seems like and the number of candidates you do or don't, and so forth. Yeah. Well, I got an issue with the reevaluation is you know, some counties use it as a shell and the you know, peanut or whatever, pea in the shell game as far as uh, how to get more money. I know we went down to Davidson County one time uh, before we went down on the performance based budgeting, and uh, we sat there with the assistant county manager, and they'd had reevaluation. I can't remember the context of the whole story. <laughs> They said they sold the public on the fact that they weren't going to raise taxes as a result of the reevaluation. But in theory, they should have lowered taxes four or five cents. And I looked at him to get revenue neutral. That's how revenue neutral came about. The whole theory of having to quote what revenue neutral is. And some people hide behind that. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he said, uh, he grinned. He just literally grinned. I can't remember the year that was, but I looked at him and I said, look, if we pull that stunt claiming reevaluation, oh, we're not going to raise your taxes. Uh, they burn our courthouse down. Myrtle Beach did that. Myrtle Beach goes on a, uh, what's called a, uh, oh, shoot. What is it? This is one thousandth of a penny. Uh, millage, millage system. Yeah, and Myrtle Beach down there one time claimed, oh, you know, we're not going to, we're, we're going to lower the millage rate by one mil. People weren't smart enough to figure it out. If I remember correctly, Tim, City of Burlington did pretty much what you just said. I don't know. 
<laughs> but it, it is a pee in the shell game, and uh, I just you know I don't have a problem with reevaluation whether it be four, six, or eight, but at least be honest about it. And, uh, you know, the cost of government should not really go up because what rebound is, in my opinion. Yeah, that Myrtle Beach deal. And it was a joke. People raised so much came down at Myrtle Beach over one mill. We're lowering it one mill. Then they had to redo it. <laughs> I ain't lying to you. It's a joke at times. All right. Um, I also wanted to ask Stacey Saunders, the director of our health department, um, if she could address the um, landscape of the coronavirus in Alamance County. Um, since this is a uh, a rapidly emerging concern for a lot of people everywhere I go it's what people are talking Everybody's about. Everybody's talking about it. So I thought it might be good in Commissioner comments to have her just tell us a little bit about what the health department in Alamance County are doing about the virus. Sure and so um, as Commissioner Daly said this is a very evolving situation so um, I put together some notes for you but I'm sure as soon as I walked in today things have changed slightly so I ask that you <laughs> Be patient with that. Um, so I'll start with just a little bit of a summary. I'm sure everybody's been following the news, but just for everyone in the audience. Um, so this um, coronavirus um, 2019, also known as COVID-19, was first detected in China. Uh, to date, there um, is now found in about 60 locations. Um, I'm going to give you some rough numbers because, like I said, that is changing like every minute. Um, so I don't want to um, sort of quote specifics, but as of um, February 29th when I had the last situation report. Uh, we had um, roughly 83 to 84,000 cases worldwide. Um, 80,000 of those roughly are in China um, with about 7,000 or so being outside of China. Um, so you can see the vast majority of them are still um, contained or still found in mainland China. Uh, with that, about 2,500 to about 3,000 deaths. Uh, we're getting closer to 3,000 um, as of this morning. And about um, 2,800 of those, 2,900 um, are in China with the remaining outside of China still. So um, again, the vast, uh, vast majority of those are still in mainland China. Uh, we have a few countries of sustained um, transmission being China, Iran, um, South Korea, Italy, and Japan. So those are the ones worldwide that we're watching. And then here in the U.S., we have 15 confirmed cases in the U.S. Um, as of yesterday or this morning, um, two deaths in the U.S., uh, 47 cases uh, in that repatriated um, population that came back to the U.S., and so far, no cases in, in North Carolina. Um, this does seem to be affecting um, older populations being greater at risk, and particularly if you're immunocompromised. So um, I like to explain this to folks and that the that coronavirus is a large family of viruses. A bit like if you think about apples. Apples are a large family of fruit. <laughs> and there are a lot lots of varieties. Of, <laughs> a lot of varieties. Um, coronavirus is very similar. Um, just as you have lots of different types of apples, there are lots of different types of coronaviruses. Some of which human species has been battling for um, lots and lots of years. Um, it can be upper respiratory infections, sometimes common cold types of things. This one in particular is epidemiologically very interesting because it's the first time we've seen it in humans. So uh, that's what makes it very interesting to public health folks and to the world, um, to be quite frankly, um, that it becomes very interesting as though uh, because we've not seen it um, in humans yet. And so um, the symptoms, um, you've probably heard this already as well, fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, usually symptoms within two to 14 days post exposure. Um, it's likely spread uh, through close contact, contact, so respiratory droplets, um, very much like your cold or flu types of things. But we are still learning about it, so every day we learn a little bit more. Um, so on a local level, um, what I wanted to be able to say to you is that it's not as if a new emerging illness comes and we say, all right, it's time to plan. This is what public health does every day. Um, this is part of our essential and our primary function, is to anticipate um, any type of emerging illness and have plans in place to protect um, and to deal with it. Um, we get to practice this and exercise it every day, sometimes in real life, um, as the kids say, in real life. Like with mumps, right? Um, so with yeah. mumps, we got to practice that in real life, that we have plans in place, we have um, protocols in place, we have resources in place, 
every day um, so that if an emerging um, infection or a communicable disease were to go into an outbreak situation, we can activate very quickly. So this um, is sort of business as usual for us that um, while an emerging infection might be very interesting, the things that we do at a local health department level are very similar to any type of communicable disease outbreak that we would be um, dealing with. We have um, trained personnel. We have our um, practice, like tabletops. We actually do um, drills, if you will, to sort of anticipate any emerging infections and what we might do. Uh, we meet with our community partners and make sure that the plans we have in place are still valid. Uh, you might have, you might remember 2015 with Ebola, as that was a global um, concern as well, and that we put lots of place, plans in place during that time and had lots of plans in place around transport with our hospital, with our EMS, and with um, emergency management. We are constantly reviewing those, um, and we'll be doing that again to make sure that whatever plans we have in place will be fitting for this uh, emerging infection as well. In addition to that, we meet with other community partners around um, control <coughs> measures, and that's just a public health term that means how to protect yourself um, and to prevent you from uh, getting an illness, and around messaging, uh, like I'm doing here, like how do we help people understand what it is. So I wanted to impress upon you that um, this is exactly what public health is supposed to do, um, and that um, this isn't something that we just hear about and then all of a sudden start doing it. We do it every day, 365 days a year. Um, and do it every day when you're not even aware that we're doing it with, say, TB, or like I said, with mumps is a great, a great example of that, um, or even foodborne illnesses that happen, um, so it happens every day. Other things that we're doing is participating in weekly state calls. Um, those happen on Tuesdays. Um, so we have our weekly state call, uh, meeting with our community partners. And um, the last thing I'll say is just for the general public that currently um, the risk of COVID-19 um, in the US and in North Carolina is still very low. Um, it is evolving. Take steps to protect yourself, very similar to the flu. Um, be sure to wash your hands. I can't stress that enough for 20 seconds. Sing the ABC song. Um, if you don't have soap, use sanitizer and alcohol-based sanitizer. Avoid touching your face. That's a hard one for kids, but <laughs> don't touch your face. Don't touch other people's faces. <laughs> That's a real hard one there. Yeah. <laughs> Avoid contact with sick people. Stay at home when you're sick. This is, these are very similar things that we would say around cold and flu. Stay at home when you're sick. Um, avoid close contact with others when you are sick. Um, cover your cough or your sneeze into your sleeve, uh, not into your hand, because guess what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and touch, right? So do it into your right, sleeve. So don't touch me. Don't touch. <laughs> um, and if you are using a tissue, make sure you discard it um, instead of keeping it in your pocket. Um, so my granny has a tendency to hold on to tissue. No, you have to throw that away. Um, and make sure you clean and disinfect um, all surfaces. So those are general precautions that we're telling everybody to do. Um, and so if you're interested in more information about COVID-19, I encourage you to go to the CDC website, um, to also the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services website. They both have coronavirus COVID-19 uh, websites. And um, North Carolina actually uh, created a call line for general um, questions around COVID. And that is 1-866-462-3821. Again, 866-462-3821 for the call line. Yeah, not an easy number. Questions? Well, I have heard that um, the death rate for the coronavirus is Probably not. Uh, I thought I heard this over the weekend. May not be as high as it typically is for the flu. <coughs> That's right. Oh, it's already like it's yeah. Time, so man. it's a little it's too soon for us to sort of have a um, mortality, a case fatality rate, or a mortality rate with it. I will tell you, in general, um, I think the ten-year trend for flu is less than one percent, teetering right around one percent. Um, history will tell us that the 1918 Spanish flu was um, about two percent, maybe a little bit more. And so um, I probably don't have enough information to tell you exactly what coronavirus will be, um, but it, it looks to be slightly um, more than that, less than 1% at this point, but it's very early. Interesting aside I heard last night, and I have not verified this, but I heard that this, uh, this is how much misinformation there is out there. I heard that the sale of Corona beer is 
down with us. I can't remember if they were either 30 or 38 percent. They related it because to Because of the coronavirus. <laughs> oh, we've heard that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have heard we have heard lots of different things. Read that things. on Facebook, did you? <laughs> I do have a question. When you could see all the people coming off of planes or whatever, and they're doing the yeah. thermometer, is this... Is that one of the symptoms that's a little bit more prevailing in this than other flu? Meaning fever? So yeah. the, the process, process that you're seeing at the airports is that the um, CDC, and this started with Ebola, um, the CDC right. started a really great um, protocol around um, with stratification around risk. And so what they're doing is, depending on where your flight is coming from, they're going to be screening at the airports. That's part of that's it. Right. Taking that's part of it. And that's right, because Same. temperature, it's your fever, that's right, it's not invasive, and a fever might be one of the first symptoms that you get, um, even like a low grade, like we get low grade fevers and seem like we can still manage, right? So it might be one of the first indicators that, um, hey, this person might need to be asked further questions about where were they, who were they in contact with? And then from that, the CDC uses that algorithm that they created to figure out where that person's gonna go. Um, I think in the very first days of this, you saw, um, folks being quarantined um, in port uh, versus you know being quarantined somewhere else or being the lowest risk or no risk, which is you get to go on your way. Right? It should be done going on the plane, not coming off. <laughs> <laughs> you mean when they get on over in a foreign country? <laughs> yeah. Before you jump off. They want them to get out. So. I, know. Yeah. I did see a young couple on TV that had been quarantined on a boat, and this was their honeymoon. So they really yeah. got to touch, test the limits of marriage real quick. <laughs> 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 All right, well, thank you very much thank for Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I have one more thing before we go into closed session. Um, I spoke to Mr. Albright before the meeting. We did receive a report about the um, Alamance Aggregates permit from the outside attorney <coughs> on uh, Friday. And so, Mr. Albright, what kind of steps would you suggest we take at this point regarding that permit review? Well, when we discussed hiring uh, the outside attorney, the board indicated its desire to have a conversation with that person mm -hmm. in closed session. And I think that's an appropriate time to plan a closed session specifically for the purpose of reviewing the letter that he prepared and uh, discussing his review, giving you time to answer, ask him, ask you questions and have him answer. And he is available for a closed session. That was like 17 pages. That's a lot and a lot to absorb. So yes. should, do you have an estimate about when he might be available? Because he lives in Asheville. So we don't really want to pay him to drive back and forth from he, Asheville to Alamance County. He frequently makes trips to Raleigh. <clears throat> He's the attorney that rewrote chapter, the first part of chapter 160D. So he works with the legislature uh, quite a bit. So I can ask him for his schedule in the next uh, few days, and we can get our schedules together and catch him on the trip to Raleigh. Well, if we have to have a special session, I think that would be a possible special call. Yes, meeting. we have a Did, special session. I believe I remember you indicated to me before this meeting that you thought he might be available on this Thursday. He, he did say that he was going to be traveling to Raleigh this Thursday. So if you'd like to schedule a meeting, sometime Thursday, if I can contact him and get the time he would be available. And that would be fine with me. I have stuff on Thursday right. that I can shift it to accommodate that. And when would we have to notice the public for a special call meeting yeah. well, on Thursday? Yeah, Just send a notice out today that we're going to have a meeting on Thursday. I can get the details for the clerk. That would be plenty of time. By the end of the day today? Yeah, Thursday works for me. Very good. I'll let you know. Is that okay with you, Mr. Sutton? I'll have to check my calendar. We certainly. <laughs> uh, it's okay with me, as yeah. far as I know. Yeah. We certainly want you to be there. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll sure. push for the morning meeting. <laughs> so the if you morning meeting um, would be better. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. If you could let Mr. Albright know so that Tori can get that out, that would be great. All right. Mr. Carter, do you have a motion? I do. I move that we now go into a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143 318.11A3 in order to preserve.
preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board of, and consult with the county attorney regarding a claim made in the case entitled Guello versus Alamance County. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, All right, we need a motion to return to open session. Second. We have a motion and a second to return to open session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. The board received legal advice from the county attorney concerning the settlement of the Aguilo claim and authorized the mediated settlement. So, all the other business of the board being concluded will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.